is connected to this structure here on the right. He researches brain and degenerative disorders. And that's very important because neuroplasticity becomes a thing that is still active, still useful, even after some part of the brain is injured or some part of or section of the brain is diseased. If not injury, then maybe we're talking about some other neurodegenerative disease. Okay. So I like to think about it as a way to work around. Your brain is, the brain itself is a universe that's hardly explored. I'll just put it that way. It has a way of working around injured areas, just like the heart can, can create vasculature that can get around injured areas. The brain can do the same way by following and strengthening different pathways around areas that are injured in order to do the same things that you used to do. So again, the brain is constantly adjusting. We don't see it happening, but your brain, my brain, we're constantly adjusting to our environment and new challenges. Whoops, whoops, not there yet. This is kind of nice. There's two kinds of neuroplasticity. Oh shoot, I'll keep the glasses on. <laughs> um, there's the ability, structural neuroplasticity, that's, that is a, a structural change due to uh, an individual's learning experience. Um, there are more synaptic connections, more neural connections involved in this. Um, and what happens too is once new pathways are formed, memory can be established from that as well. So you use it over. You're going to use that pathway over and over again. So it creates a sort of physical change within the brain. That's one. Two is a functional neuroplasticity, okay? This is where the, the synapses of the brain <clears throat> following a dysfunction of some kind, maybe due to disease or an injury, say it could be a traumatic injury, it could be a stroke. Um, and what happens is pre-existing neurons in these cases, uh, in many cases, die. So what happens is um, during injury, new modeling takes place with uh, the neurons and the synaptic connections that are left. And some, in some cases, not always, this is, this is another form of that making new connections, uh, recovery of lost functions can occur. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, one could never, I've got books on the brain. Let's just put it this way. My wife wants me to ditch some of them at home because you've got too many books on the brain. How many of these are you actually going to read? I said, I don't know. I got to look at them first. I got to read them first. New, uh, in fact, Linda showed me a new book over there sitting on the desk, uh, uh, also about brain. So yeah, fascinating stuff, fascinating stuff. So two forms of neuroplasticity, two, two ways in which the brain can adapt and can uh, learn to do things over again by a different pathway. All right, I like this slide. Brain is always under construction from beginning, born, you know, to, to our end, constantly under construction. That is neuroplasticity. I call it constant maintenance. That's what I call it. Um, you can see, if you look at this graph, <clears throat> effort needed to produce learning when we're younger is easier, okay? However, when we get toward adulthood, and you can see the line here marks roughly 29 or 30, it becomes increasingly hard. Um, we're, not, uh, we're not making as, um, I should say, all of, our, all of our neurons are made and produced by them. And 
for lack of a better way of putting it, there is some dying that's going on at a certain point in our life. And so we have to work harder. When I mean dying is connections, neurons uh, within the brain. But at a certain point, that becomes harder. The effort becomes harder to learn, to adapt. Doesn't mean we can't do it later on in life, because we can, we can. Because you can see the other curve goes and starts at a very high, <laughs> high point and begins to move downward um, toward uh, older adulthood, the brain's ability to learn. Okay. Yes, that looks kind of depressing at first glance, but it really it isn't. Because even at our even at increasing age, the brain can still learn new things. Um, as you go on. And I'm going to bring up a case in point here pretty soon that was taken from uh, the current issue of brain and life. It has to do with a, a man in his early 70s who actually makes a living creating crosswords for the New York Times. And he had a stroke. And then how he recovered from that and the, the, the kind of um, plan and goals that he made in order to do so. And it had a lot to do with neuroplasticity. So <clears throat> in, in any case, these bullet points on the side mark, you know, different places in life. Because adulthood includes early, middle, and late adulthood. I actually borrowed this slide. Uh, I borrowed it from bra our brain and gender differences because I thought it was very appropriate. So I borrowed it. Now, <clears throat> this looks very complicated. <laughs> but in essence, it's showing how the brain through neuroplasticity is able to compensate for injury. Okay, um, it's not easy, but it's very possible. Um, if you know what controls what, because the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of the body. The right side of the brain controls, the, the right hemisphere of the brain controls the left side of the body. However, we have, and this is especially important for women, we have a structure called the corpus callosum. In men, it tends to be a little thinner, less dense. And that's because it doesn't have as many fibers. In women, it's seven times as dense as it is in men. So that means many, many, many more fibers. So an example would be men have Broca's and Wernicke's area on this side, on the left side of the brain how they process speech and then how they make speech and create speech. Women have the ability on both sides of the brain and that's because of the thick corpus callosum. And so there, if they lose speech due to a stroke, it's easier for them to get it back. But um, it's very possible with neuroplasticity if a workaround is possible in this case, and the damage is not severe enough, you can regain losses like motor function, language, walking, um, surface sensation, skin, okay? So um, the, what's shown up here in the very top of the slide um, has to do with uh, what's happening during injury and then repair. Um, and this takes weeks to months to years. It's not something that happens overnight. Neuroplasticity doesn't work that way. It take, it's a lot of hard work. The thing that's miraculous about it is that it can occur. And, that's, and this is why if you have an injury, if you have an illness, or disease, if you work hard enough 
within therapy and you have a plan, it's possible to establish those functional connections to a certain point again. All is not, not lost. Hope is not completely lost, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Um, I used to see a couple of men in the gym. Both of them clearly had suffered some kind of brain injury. And uh, I was very surprised when I, after talking with them what they had gained back. And I, I was not that familiar with something with this concept of neuroplasticity, but they were in effect using that. The brain has the capability throughout life. It's a little harder to do it as we age, but that doesn't mean we can't. We can. Other people call it, other people. The literature has different names for this. They call it uh, neural sometimes rather than neuro or brain plasticity. And um, here again, you see the processes, what's going on. I mean, this could be changes due to a viral attack as well. Another possibility is you have amyloid plaques, which in the case of some uh, brain illnesses occurs. You have neural loss. So we have even if we have no brain disease or impact, we have neural loss over time. We do, that's, that is a fact. But that, again, even under normal conditions, um, uh, neuroplasticity is even more possible at that point. It's harder if there's a, a brain disease involved or you're recovering from some sort of uh, brain attack. So um, anyway, so it is, okay, the ability of using the neural networks that you do have. Um, there's so much new technology. I wish I could, I wish I could boil down what the literature says about um, recovery and how neuroplasticity matters. I've only seen that term recently in the literature you know, over the last 10 years. But you know, apparently they're um, using that. Uh, there's remarkable progress, or at least they they know it as remarkable progress. They know it as neuroplasticity, right? Rather than neurogenesis. Genesis means you're making all new neurons. You can't create all new neurons. That happens at the very beginning. In some cases, there are some helper neurons that, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, um, they help support the neurons that make the connections. Now, those can uh, don't suffer the same kind of insults as the other types that go from the central nervous system to the peripheral. They're helper cells, kind of like our um, uh, white cells that help with disease. Same principle. It's a, again, it's a process of rewiring, um, finding a way around. The heart does it with blood vessels. Why can't the brain do it with neurons? And it does. It's just, we haven't noticed it. Um, so, If you look at the brain from the standpoint of what side does what, this this is a slide I also borrow because it makes sense. If you have an insult on one side of the brain or the other, um, it's possible to get that back, but it has to come through rewiring and re-networking. Networking is a better word. Yes, re-networking and then using that same networking in order to do some of the things you did before the injury. So I put this slide up here because you can see if, and 
if an injury occurs on one side or the other of the brain, you can see what might be lost. Does that make sense? Um, and in, in men, after strokes, no matter what kind, uh, it's harder for them to get back language than it is for women. I, I found it remarkable that um, women have much more white matter, which means they can communicate one side of the brain to the other. Men have more gray matter, uh, which is more you know, analytical perhaps, but to communicate one side to the other is not as strong. Doesn't mean women aren't, can't be analytical, they certainly can. They have a much better ability and I haven't studied or looked at the possibility of the plasticity thing, how men do it versus women. That would be a totally different subject of how that happens. But I, I, can, I can imagine it might be easier for women because of that area of the brain that communicates right and left. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. That's, how I, that's what I think without having done any look into it. I thought about that, but I thought, no, I won't add that to this PowerPoint. <laughs> Dodie had a question. Oh, yeah. I have a friend that's 84, never had a brain injury, but she absolutely rebelled against cell phones. And she still looked all over for them to be able to put a landline into the house. It's oh. extremely expensive and there isn't much of anything being done. Yeah. So she's to the point that she doesn't know how to answer the problem. Ah. Uh. So she, I mean, it's as if somebody handed her a phone and, and she didn't even know what it was. Is she it even possible for her to at least like she could what her, yeah, I but mean, what would it take well it would take it would take her for one thing i don't, i guess she's given up on the landline yeah as yeah, a possibility they, they could put it. um if she received a basic phone which i think is simpler she could start there and she has to want to. You see, creating these pathways, I think, is a conscious effort as well. She just gets angry at um, <laughs> I think I understand that. But part of this is a conscious effort. Um, the gentleman in The Brain and Light, you know, because he was so used to creating puzzles of his own. He was good at solving problems, basically. And so when he had his stroke and his recovery, he saw it as a problem to solve, which he went about doing. He had a plan for doing that. And um, perhaps it was his background in creating puzzles that could be solved, like crosswords, which I appreciate because I, I do the New York Times. Uh, I only get to Wednesday. After Wednesday, though, they become a little bit more difficult. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate his um, contribution to puzzles. Puzzles, puzzles, uh, that's how we keep our brain active in the first place. We can keep those connections going. But after his stroke, it meant, it meant a lot more. And so... Um, we have another question with John. Oh, yeah. Talking about puzzles, and that's word puzzles. What about like Sudoku, math puzzles? Yes. Those would do the same thing. They would. Yeah, they would. I would think if you did these things before an injury, um, you could do them again. Might take longer. The gentleman with the stroke is now back making puzzles for the New York Times, which is phenomenal. What he's trying to get back are the, the physicality of things. And so what he did is he's taken up ping pong. 
He never, I guess he never played it before, but he took up ping pong for hand-eye coordination. So trying to create, yeah. You're talking about little shorts? Yes. Yeah, he had a, an unbroken streak of days playing ping pong going back for at least a decade. And I think it is that competition thing that he had because he, he lives in my brother's is that right? And the muscle memory? It's I a think muscle part memory, of muscle memory. It's a thing. Yeah. And he has yes. a ping pong parlor in town. I read about that, and, yes. And but that's and you hear him on Sundays, and he is still not there because the, he, he's not moving air well. He's still learning how to talk. He's not got the aggressive edge that he and and joy edge that used to be there. But he is, you could hear in the three months he's been back that he has been progressing. Yes. It is, it is that physical competition that I think is driving him as much as his intellectual curiosity. He's, he was, he was gorilla to, to maintain, you know, ping pong around the world. He would land, find a place, play a game before he did anything else. It's it it one of the main well, I think I, I I think I'm reading his story. He had a plan. I mean, he didn't give up. He had a lot of help too, of course, but he was determined to do some of these things again. And granted, yeah, full function may never quite come back, but he can at some point. Uh, gain and then support that gain to uh, enhance his life at, from that point. I mean, who knows? A lot, a lot of physicians like to say, well, all right, pronounce, this is as good as it's gonna get and it's not gonna get any better. Um, but certainly you have to want, you got a desire, uh, that has to be there too. If you don't, well then, I've seen how that has basically gone in the other direction. If someone gives up hope. Um, but, you know, these are things you can't see. Like, I want to, I still want to compare it to the heart because, yeah, granted, the cells in the heart that are dead are dead. They can't be resurrected. But you can go around those dead areas with new capillary action having a way of forming blood vessels to get around some of those dead areas so that the heart uh, doesn't completely fail. Well, in the same way, neurons over time and hard work can learn to get around some of those areas that are dead and may not come back to life. Uh, and that's by that process of neuroplasticity. So it's fascinating stuff. And it holds a lot of promise for the future. I still think the brain is a universe that we've just hit the just the surface of. You know, we think about space, but I think about the universe and the brain. So we just touch, we just touch the surface of it. And there's so much potential there. I like the fact though that it can repair, just like the heart. The fact that it's, it, if it's not too bad. It can repair the brain. If it's not too badly injured, it can repair too. So it's fascinating stuff and gives me hope. Ah, here's where I, Will Shorts uh, and John just made reference to Will uh, in a little more detail. Um, uh, there is a, an MD back east. She's a neurologist at uh, Yale New Haven Hospital in Connecticut. And she, she makes a statement about Will playing table tennis, ping pong. Um, it could benefit stroke recovery as well as treat patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, the hand-eye coordination you know, requires a certain kind of neural pathway of uh, firing and when you think about it, these pathways all have to be firing at the same time in order to get this to work. Um, and over time, that pathway gets reinforced. 
if you use it often enough, it gets reinforced and comes becomes stronger. And that is that is beneficial to neuroplasticity. That is neuroplasticity. It's the rerouting and reinforcement of those neural pathways. When we were young, the brain did it naturally. It naturally pruned old pathways, got rid of them. For stronger pathways that you used all the time. And so um, in a sense, that can be drawn on again here as we age. And in this case, if injury occurs, it can happen again. It's not like it was when we were younger. It, it isn't. I like the fact, though, that Will has been able to come back to creating crosswords. I like that because crosswords are, I guess people who like crosswords can appreciate that. Maybe. But the person who makes them, that's kind of, to me, it's a bit astonishing. And it's, it's like something I couldn't do, you know? I like solving them if I can. I like I like that part of it, but it's amazing. And th that was the first time I was introduced to him. Is reading it in the, the most recent Brain and Life magazine. I get it anyway. It comes free to me in the mail. It's like quarterly, I think, or every couple months, two, three, something like that. So um, I know he's got a long way to go yet, maybe, but. The fact that he's up and doing things again and so quickly is pretty astonishing to me. I would check to see, to see letters to the editor in December or February because people who know him will say he didn't take up from him. He resumed being. Oh, okay. He resumed because there is that pathway that is deeply there. He's been making puzzles since he was 20. So he resumes, so he is rebuilding the structure that was and then finding the, the loops around the damage. So the damaged area didn't involve the pathways that he used before when it came to hand-eye coordination. Some of it, it could be that the decision-making to how do you move this the right left or right? Okay. Yes. Standing, moving your feet. So maybe some of that, maybe some of that had to change right. due to the CBA. Right. But that's where I would But think. he played, he played, he played ping pong prior to that. Yeah. Okay. Would, but see, I would check this as a fact checker, which I once was, check the journalist. Got it. I, that's where I want to see the letters to the editor because they will say, "Ha ha." <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're probably you're you're right. You're probably right on that, John. I don't know enough about him, but uh, when I read the story, I I was just it, I thought, "Wow, this is neuroplasticity." Well, it is happening here in a more recent. Uh, I want to say in a more recent. Uh, uh, happening, happening, happening. Um, no, that doesn't make sense. But uh, in a more recent injury of note, mm -hmm. somebody who's who is making these puzzles, which you know, I I immediately, as he said, New York Times too. I thought, hmm. as I do those crosswords, <laughs> so very cool. I'll look for that. Okay, where's my cursor? I hate it when everything is so light. Oops. All right. The, okay. Neurogenesis is, is that process that is happening earlier in life. It happens by stem cell. Um, they're created through neural stem cells. Neuroplasticity, on the other hand, it's a it's a more complex process with existing connections or new connections that are being formed. So it's not the formation of neurons, but it's connections pre-existing. That's the biggest uh, difference uh, between the plasticity part and the genesis part. 
Now, it doesn't mean some neurons don't regenerate. They do. It's just that the neurons we're talking about, no. But the, the ability to make new connections, again, to me, it's a bit of a miracle that those, those connections can be made at all. They can get past an injured area and you can resume doing and having control over certain movements, speech again, um, uh, ability to walk, et cetera. So here's another slide borrowed. The brain is like a muscle and it needs a bunch of things. It needs to be fed, okay? Glucose being the, the biggest thing that it, it needs, glucose to the brain. That's what energizes and keep it, keeps it going, aside from oxygen, of course. <laughs> um, there's the waste removal process, okay? That's where blood and the cerebral spinal fluid come into play. There's rest. And during rest and decrease of stressors, hopefully, the brain goes through a cleaning out sort. And then mental stimulation. And that's really for uh, neuroplasticity as well. In neurogenesis, we're making those pathways after the neurons are fully formed. And this is happening all over the brain. And Right. As a side note, our consciousness is re usually really in the frontal uh, lobes of our brains, okay, prefrontal cortex. Now, this quote, reading this, I think it's from the gentleman down at the bottom in the right-hand corner from my perspective. Jerry Feldman, Berkeley. So I believe he teaches at Berkeley. Neural development and learning is moving from mystery to routine science. And I'll be thinking about that. I don't know what you think. I mean, a lot of stuff about the brain to me is still a mystery. Uh, but it is amazing, you know, that science is finding new ways to help us regain after injury and um uh, i don't know about using more of our brain but i would say regaining after injury being the biggest thing yeah we know enough to shape theories of how our brains learn skills including languages how we acquire and, and use knowledge as well so I, I like that. I, I still, I'm still trying to unpack it myself, um, because it's. I would say for me, it's still more of this a mystery than routine science. I would think it's anything but routine. Maybe one day it will be routine, but um, so I kind of like that quote when it comes to the brain. And that's why I put it in there. I borrowed that one too. And that is the end of PowerPoint. This is, I didn't bring up other things which I could have as far as brain and recovery goes or brain and um, health goes because I thought this is a specific subject with some, but something nobody had really heard of here. That's why I use. I don't know. Had any of you ever heard of the term neuroplasticity before? Some of you have. Mm -hmm. From who? Neurology. Yeah. Okay, your neurologist. Did he define it for you? No. Yeah, in a very vague way. Okay. See, that's not something that's spoken of very much. My neurologist never spoke of it. But I hadn't had a stroke. I have. I had problems with migraine headaches and some other things. So the, the, the subject didn't come up. Um, so I'm just curious how many in here had heard of that term before. Maybe it was something more recent for some of you. 
Anybody out there in Zoom land heard of this term neuroplasticity? Crickets. <laughs> Me have got sleep dreams. Um, it was sort of out there when there was that whole wave talking about the Alzheimer's yes. a few years ago when they were they sort of beat around the bush with with uh, uh, how do you distinguish that from a stroke, how do you distinguish that from being knocked unconscious and as a football player. Yes, like concussions and yeah. Uh, but it was not dealt with as an essential subject because it was seen as something a little more involved, but they used the term plasticity to mean uh, flexibility. Yes. Or, and, and to yeah, and under nor normal circumstances, there was a program that, uh, well, there were some good examples in this program on the amazing brain. That was the title of it. There was a man in his late 90s who had taken up I think the violin for the first time and was playing it. Uh, he had taken up um, art as well. So these are things he had never done before, but he was taking them up. And why is that something amazing as well? It's possible to even at near a hundred to create those pathways uh, from existing you know, uh, neurons to learn something new and to create the strong pathway from doing that. Uh, and honestly, I thought that was amazing. They had an individual who had suffered a stroke and she was so used to using one side. She, she had one side, I think it was her, uh, her right side of the brain had the stroke. And so, um, uh, a part of her personality had changed and she had to she had to learn to somehow get some of that back. Uh, gosh, I wish I remembered how she did that. And she was a neurologist herself. She was a neurologist. And so um, that was another example of someone who had sustained an injury in a way and was still able to, to find a way back to, um, it's, it's not just uh, forgetfulness, and I'm having forgetfulness right now. It was something else that was a part of her that she had to work hard to get back to as an individual. And when she was interviewed for the film, it was hard to tell she was missing but um, she, um, you know, she's, she actually said, I'm, this is what's going on. And you might be able to identify that and how I'm expressing and how I'm talking. It was personality things. And it may be right brain, it may have been things like the creativity aspects, et cetera, uh, and who she was personality wise that she was trying to get back. She a neurologist? Yeah, know? she was a neurologist. She, she had a stroke. She, I, that, yes. she was on NPR, I think, when that problem came up. Yes. And she diagnosed herself, and she drove herself to the hospital. Oh. <laughs> the, 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 her biggest problem now is she has only short-term memory. She can't That's it. Remember. It's the memories of the past. I knew I was getting onto something when I mentioned it, but I wasn't 100% sure. Yeah. Um. Yes, um, because there are areas of the brain where short-term memory is temporarily stored before it's moved to another area where memory, a more permanent memory is stored. That's right. Uh, yeah, my memory of that is she not so She has access to back, but she has written evidence of the back steps. So to me, um, being able to find some way to work with that is an amazing sort of thing. Um, but in any case, um, 
Yeah, I have I have copies of that somewhere. I don't know where I put them. Actually, on a physical disc. Hmm. I don't know where I put it. Too. But um, yeah, the title is "The Amazing Brain." Oh. In fact, we showed that to our class downstairs on brain and gender differences as uh, one of their first assignments because there was they had to fill in the blanks for a uh, take home test. And then they took a quiz later on on it because it, it's a fa it was a fascinating document. In any case, um, neuroplasticity. Well, at least if you hadn't heard about it much, now you know something about it and it's saved to the website. I thought it was fascinating enough to use it um, because of something as we age, we can take care of our brain. We can use our brain still instead of giving up on, you know, I couldn't possibly remember to do that. Too many steps, not necessarily. So if a 98 year old can learn how to play the violin for the first time, uh, I'd say there's hope for the rest of us. And, you know, it, that's the thing. And then if there's an injury, like the gentleman who makes crossword puzzles more or less for a living for the, and maybe other things too, for the New York Times. And those are difficult crossword puzzles. Um, but, you know, his recovery too is inspiring. Fascinating as well. The ping pong thing gets me. And I, I hope he continues that. In any case, any other questions out there in Zoom land, maybe? One, one little oh, closer. yeah, I'm sorry. Really closer than Zoom land. Oh, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Uh, how about, uh, I saw a, forget his name, you know, it's a, he's a psychiatrist in some stripe on Channel 6. He talked about the connection between nutrition and 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 and, and, and uh, the pharmaceuticals and so forth in the brain. He's of the persuasion that uh, the psychologists uh, they have a tendency to drug companies, et cetera, et cetera, basically go by symptoms, cluster clusters, and so forth, and they're attacking the symptoms rather rather than looking at the, the, the biological roots of what's going on. And I found that an interesting discussion. I saw it saw it on Channel Six and. Well, no, any thoughts? Well, I think that's that's true. There's a lot of you know sim addressing of symptoms, but not actually going to the root of the problem. I I agree. I agree. I've not heard this individual. You said he's on Channel Six. Yeah, on Channel Six. Okay. Is he a regular? I I've seen him a time or two here and there. He oh. pops up. Psychiatry, you said? He's a psychiatrist. He's okay. a psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, he's, he, 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 boy, this is controversial. He went out here and discussed all of his strong feelings in those areas. And he's done a lot, according to his statement. And I haven't done any research on this. He's done a lot. Um, well, nutrition for sure, exercise for sure, engaging in activities that are novel, maybe, as well as ones that you know, activities you love to do and you want to do again, and attitude, because I know a lot of people who have had strokes, a lot of individuals, I still see them in the hospital when I work with students. Uh, they look depressed. And some are on medicines to counter depression. Um, maybe in the short run. Although I also know people who've been on medicines that alter the brain chemistry. Boy, that's a huge subject. I'm wondering we're talking about medications and brain chemistry. Um, especially as new drugs come out. Uh, touted as miracle drugs without studies for long-term impact. Uh, how they can be lauded or being miraculous 
And I thought, well, yeah. I commented in a couple of <laughs> I commented in a couple of blogs on this that one has to be cautious because we don't have long-term studies. How old is this drug? How long has it been used? How wide pop how wide of a population has it been used? Uh, what who are the subjects? What are they dealing with? You know, is it only bipolar disorder? Is it only depression? Is it only anxiety? Or are you talking about using this on, you know, uh, on a great many other individuals? I, yeah, to me, I, I look at these things, I'm a little more cautious. I don't want to call it untrust. I don't want to call it distrust, but maybe I'm more cautious when it comes to stuff like that, that everything can be addressed with a pill versus other natural approaches. I mean, with this individual here, he's not just simply using neuroplasticity. He has a lot of other help. He has other interventions. He's got experts helping him. Uh, he has a partner that helps him. He's working with exercise, nutrition, and diet. Um, a plan being made, this positive attitude, uh, um, the severity of his injury one way or another. Is it severe or is it not severe? What is he capable of doing now versus, um, you know, what he was able to do before the injury? Yeah. If I, I know it, for Alzheimer's dementia, we really don't have a lot of treatments for that, for instance. We have oodles of treatments for all kinds of depression, but dementia, we don't know quite what to do with. Um, but nutrition is big. It's a big deal. Nutrition in the brain. So, um, so was his take more on the nutrition side versus... Well, his, take, his take was that, that basically they're treating the symptom rather than the cause. Yeah, or the, 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 in, in, the, in the medical approach. So if they haven't found the cause, how can you treat it well, effectively? He, he was, his language is stronger than mine there. Yeah. So I, I found it, well, persuasive, it, 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 actually. In the hospital, was, in the hospital, though, we call it, We call it fishing or searching in the dark is when we don't know why something is happening. We keep doing things to try to figure that out. We keep treating symptoms, et cetera, et cetera, even though we don't know the cause. You know, some terms, a term like idiopathic, meaning we don't know why the pathology exists. We know how it is in this condition, this condition, in this condition, that somebody presents with this but we don't know why it's happening in this individual. It shouldn't be, but we don't know why. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, I think I agree with him. You need to get to the cause in order to effectively treat. In the meantime, you probably use the best science or the best medicine um, to treat what you do know. That's the thing. Hard to treat what you don't know. <laughs> Although I think we try to do that sometimes. But that's a good point. What's your name again? Oh, Brent. Okay, Brent. Very good to meet you. Uh, very good addition. Very good point. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I'm worried about brain chemistry and change. What a child is that this is coming from personal experience. My grandson was born addicted, then got into street drugs and marijuana and even fentanyl, almost died from fentanyl once. And he he doesn't have any plan for the future, any any plan for life at all. He's sort of stuck and he's like 25 now. And what are the chances of a brain changing or being helped in any way so that, or is that a, a life sentence that he has? It's not, it's not. 
it's hugely difficult when individuals are trying to get off heroin or cocaine, uh, what happens at the level of the cell is that the natural receptors and the natural, uh, our own endorphins, maybe our own dopamine is not being created anymore because it's being replaced by the drug. And so what happens is that over time, the, um, the process of releasing our own natural forms of those drugs basically peters out. Doesn't mean it won't ever do it again, but it's difficult to get it back. And then the receptors on the cells, especially the neurons, uh, only at that point, as long as they're addictive, only recognize what's brought in from the outside, like heroin or cocaine or something of that nature. Um, and we have, believe it or not, we have our own cannabinoid receptors also. But if you're introducing all of this from the outside uh, and you stop, there is a long process. Sometimes it's lifelong uh, individuals who are addicted. However, with certain measures, I've seen, I've seen and read about individuals in recovery, long-term recovery, that slowly are able to replace the natural painkillers and natural feel-good, um, uh, uh, I want to say, hormones or transmitters like dopamine and serotonin by doing other things that produce those good feelings. And many that I've seen use exercise or some other hobby and they do it you know, daily over and over again, maybe for many, many years or for a lifetime. Uh, and as long as they stay off the other things, they can regain function of normal release of those neurotransmitters and hormones once again. And then the cells that actually recognize your own versus something from the outside begin to uh, regenerate. And will I want to say they will start to receive your own endogenous meaning from inside you, uh, your, those uh, substances that your body makes natural. But it is not an easy process. It is not an easy process. It's possible, though. Yes, it's possible. And some people stay uh, in in that state for a very long time. Um, some people never leave the addicted state. It's difficult. It's difficult. Um, doesn't mean it can't happen. Yeah. Is it so that they get some positive yes it's progressive it's not an all at once return to normal it takes time it takes time um because those substances have to at that point recognize in the body that there's no longer some exogenous meaning from outside the body form of this substance in the bloodstream anymore and once they recognize that too the body will start um, those uh, re places where the uh, substances are released will come out of dormancy, for lack of a better way of putting it, and begin to release those substances back into the bloodstream so that other cells uh, will receive them, including neural cells, uh, so that that feeling in the brain will return from your own natural uh your own natural painkillers, the endorphins, or the own natural feel-good substances like dopamine or serotonin. Because that's what those substances from the outside take over. And uh, they enhance that feeling too, depending on the dose of the drug. They get feel along the way, natural, because it's been going. Well, yes. 
They do, but it's not an easy process. It's slower, but it's possible to gain it back. But this is something too, because what I know about addicts is that many of them are never fully cured. They have to, they have to work at it day in and day out. Relapse, relapse is not something that's abnormal. It happens. That's been my experience dealing with individuals who've relapsed back in alcohol, into alcohol or back into heroin, for instance. Um, it has, boy, there, there's so much behind the scenes uh, things going on there too uh, that can make a difference. Um, you know, genetics is a big thing. You say that your grandson born into, and it's possible to be born into withdrawal with uh, individuals who are already addicted and they give birth to a child that already has that and very possible for them to go into withdrawal soon after. And they feel the same things that the mother felt. That's very possible, yes. You have all sorts of issues, ADHD and those kind of things. Yes. Amber, his development, motivational factors are no, no longer there. Even if you exercise or if you do anything or if you see anything positive in the future, he doesn't, I mean, he, he can do it short term. He can make promises. Yeah. But they, they're short lived. Well, if he learns to, if he has short term goals and can live up to those, when he reaches it, I've heard I've heard of others making short term goals like short term strides, and uh, they reach that point, and they decide to create a new short term goal, and it sounds very tedious, um, almost as if is it worth it? Yeah, um, I would encourage that when he gets to a point. And he right to the end and almost completes the task and then stops. Yeah. That's the pattern. Wow. That is difficult. That is that is so difficult. Um, you know, it's not that I've sat I sat down and talked with hard hardened addicts, but sometimes I see I used to see the same individuals come in all the time. And uh, you know. Blood alcohol was way up, or they came in and it was cocaine this time instead. Same person. Yeah. And it's hard to bring that subject up with them unless they want to talk about it. Yeah. Yes. I know a couple of people who are alcoholics. They clear with alcohol. They know that there with you know, the same goals in mind every day. And that can't be easy. That can't that can't be easy, especially if someone has multiple addictions. I know my oldest brother did. Um, but um, he also had other um, um, mental psychological disorders as well. And it was a constant thing. He never, he never quite over, he never did quite overcome his battles, if you want to call it that, I guess. There's no easy answer. I wish, you know, I wish there was some substance. I wish there was some, you know, uh, procedure to quell those desires, to change brain chemistry. This is why for me, messing with brain chemistry, I'm a little, uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, okay as little as possible. If you could get as little as possible and get something to work, wonderful. Okay, cross the other bridge when you get to it, if something doesn't. 
try something else. Um, maybe that doesn't require, because every drug you take that's like that changes your brain chemistry. It does. That, that is a fact. That's why, you know, when I look, listen to these blogs about new approaches, I always add, you know, I think we need to be cautious. You know, I don't want to be a killjoy, but I think we need to be cautious. And are there any long-term studies for this? What are the results of what they do have? What do they show? Who's doing the study? Is it the, is it the manufacturer of the drug that's doing the study? <laughs> Is that what they're, you know, is that, are the scientists who actually work for the company doing this study? I always, I always ask questions like that. I'm, where, I'm just a little wary of it. Um, but yeah, that's a good, those are good questions. Those, those are good, those are issues concerning the brain. As much as neurons concern the brain, there's the chemistry because neurons release a lot of those particular substances that you're referring to. We have our own analogs of those substances that people use from the outside. You mess with those analogs, the long term, you're changing things. I, 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 you know, it's true. It's true. You've probably heard of Dr. Bill. Before. Oh, yes. yes sends people to treatment program and they claim there is I mean, he talks about a lot about the brain and what drugs do to the brain and all that and there are things that can be done to reverse that or change it or do something I, I don't know whether, how valid that is well yeah uh, <laughs> I think he represents a more popular science although I don't think it's completely that way but, you know, with something you see or hear on TV or the radio, uh, you hear it maybe further, I think for, for most of us, further research looking into it would be a good idea rather than accepting it based on face value yeah. or what someone else said. I've been I've been a skeptic of these things since I got into nursing. Um, you know, except for some things. Now, I don't mean that for all things, just for some things. There was definitely definitely a lot of life-changing drugs out there that work and are useful, especially for the ones concerning the heart and our blood vessels, our lungs, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to drugs, there's I've learned there's always a trade-off. It's kind of like you have someone who is, has so many medications in their system. It's like, well, why are we giving them this? It's going to cause that. Well, then, you know, it's I'm told, well, it's because you have to weigh this, which is more important at this point, you know, that um, we might change their electrolyte balance to a dangerous level, but we get rid of a lot of fluid. Etc. You know, when we're giving them three different kinds of diuretics, you know, that kind of thing. It's kind of like, well, we got to weigh the we got to weigh the consequences here. And I get that it's because sometimes it's a matter of approach, and maybe they have no other alternative. But yeah, it's, uh, oh yeah. Did you stop recording? No. I have not. No. Oh, stop it. <laughs> God, I have forgotten this 